This is the podcast between an old school mentor and a digital mentee on managing and or working with people, navigating a career, growing profits, and not killing your coworkers along the way. Now let's join the consultant, Hayden Shaw, and the millennial who fixes Hayden's iPhone, Seth Tower Heard. Here we are. This is the Consultant in the Millennial Podcast. My name is Seth Tower Heard, entrepreneur, uh, occasional journalist, and uh, actually uh, syndicated radio host as well. He's Hayden Shaw. He's helped over 30,000 managers in his career at some of the biggest uh, name brand companies in the world and also a lot of small to medium sized uh, family style corporations and nonprofits. Uh, I run a company called Digital Profit Farm. Uh, we do stuff. I'll tell you about it later. All right. So I want to get into the topic because we're already two minutes in the Facebook Live video. And uh, hello, your dog was afraid of me earlier. Um, yeah, as far as brands that are doing well with millennials, the, the brand of your dog, like it did not, did not go well until now. It didn't rank, yeah. Uh, Shih Tzus, they're not that smart. They're cute, but not that smart. <laughs> oh, but look at that face. That's right. They do look like an Ewok from like the third episode of Star Star Wars. Yeah, my sister-in-law said that she thought I loved dogs more than anyone except for her five-year-old, and I honestly think that's one of the best compliments I've ever got. <laughs> that's not a bad compliment. <laughs> okay, so we don't normally just angle at controversy or for clickbait, but there is a lot to break down here with the whole uh, Nike situation. So people were like, uh, you know, Nike blah 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 they are dead you saw these morons on facebook throwing away new balance shoes because they didn't know the difference because they have an n <laughs> and everybody's like oh this is you know this is the end of nike and yet you know a few days later nike had come out with record profits and in particular they are crushing it with younger buyers okay so uh, there's something actually I think yeah they're way up job on this yeah they're way up it surprised yeah. everyone but uh, their stock is up their sales are up and the approval rating of males in their younger twenties twenties and younger twenties especially um, is way up okay so. Like I said, I think we're eventually going to land on something where this applies to dang near every job. But, I mean, the stuff you talk about when everybody's like, how do I keep my millennial employees? How do I think about, you know, a few years down the road here when I've got, uh, you know, whatever the next thing is. You call them the connectors, I think. You know, the high school kids that are going to be in the workforce in four to six years. Oh, good memory. Yeah, the connectors, yeah. though. Yeah. So, the people uh, right now, you know, right now they're 17. Um or so, but yes, they're they're coming into college. The next generation, sometimes called Generation Z, they are coming soon. Okay, so why did this work? This is obviously a huge gamble. Colin Kaepernick, you know, no longer I, I, probably the only. Uh, I don't want to say the only person with a shoe deal that doesn't do anything because that's insulting. However, he does not have an active job in pop culture. He's not, you know, he's not a pop star like you know you're seeing people in music get shoe deals now, and he's not an actor and he's not an active professional athlete. Yeah, the irony is Nike bet on him when the NFL has chosen not to. Okay. Yeah, so that's the irony of the situation. And uh, it does have some implications for doing business. And it's in many ways going to be scary for companies and older generations because what it means is uh, what you're seeing is a very clear rift between generations from a marketing standpoint. So basically what Nike said is we're going to get young and one of the easiest ways to get young is to not be old. And so if we have to get rid of people who are, you know, um, younger boomers and traditionalists uh, and go younger with our core demographic, then that's the, you know, then that's a great move for us to make. And if nothing else, we're going to get a huge amount of attention and a huge amount of buzz because of it. And uh, I, I think in many ways, Nike is, I think Nike's always bet on the athlete. I haven't done a lot with Nike, but they have some very interesting philosophies about athletes. And as you know, Nike has, all, has taken some controversial stances before in supporting athletes. They were one of the few companies that stuck with Tiger Wood right after the you know, his wife's accusations. And uh, so they've stuck with athletes. They've shown support for athletes, and uh, you know they're they're taking a they're taking a stand culturally in identity politics. They're taking a stand in a very. Um, sensitive issue and and so far it's paid off great and i think what i think their thought is um like disney has taken some stands before it'll fade over time with those that don't like it but it won't fade with their core demographic and okay. so i think that's what they're betting on that's a really good point because people uh who aren't me and it's only one company for me uh people who aren't me tend not to 
uh, be able to stick to protesting things very well or boycotting things very well. And the <laughs> what? I just like it. people who aren't me, you are a tenacious man. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I told Amanda this, which you should not tell your eight and a half months pregnant wife these things. But there was somebody over, and I have a Ford. I, we have a Honda and then a Ford product vehicle. And a guy at the gas station. Um, asked me, this just happened uh, a couple weeks ago, he asked me why I bought a Ford instead of a Chevy, and I said because I don't believe in socialism and I was robbed by that company and you were too because they never completely paid their government loan from the bailout uh, he had certain choice words for me, and I just sort of stood there like, are you going to come into my personal space or not and he chose to get into his uh, socialist mobile that actually runs on the dollars of your, the tax money you will never get back from that company and drive away so, you know, I, I would say I'm the exception to the rule, and that's the only company I feel that way about because Chrysler actually paid it back. They did. And uh, one of these days, hopefully GM will do well enough to... Uh, oh, why, why would they now? <laughs> why would they now? They... Well, cause you, I guess because you're the only one who remembers, they probably shouldn't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, from a business standpoint. Well, yeah, so that's uh, that's the thing is that uh, – and the news cycle is so dang fast and, like, the whole, the whole kind of hot take culture is so fast now that even if people are mad at you, it seems to go quick as a company. I think it's a little harder as an individual. I think you can get your life ruined on social media quick and, like, never recover from that. But for whatever reason, for whatever reason corporations don't seem to feel the brunt long term. What I think is interesting is that uh, – um, the core demographic of who's going to buy a lot of shoes, which I would say, for the most part, is people under 30. Um, and, and, you know, it skews above that, too. I've, you know, we, we have a friend that said he has 30 pairs of Nikes. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> Nathan, um, he, he said he's got 30 pairs. So, uh, you know, for the most part, Nike is going to make way more money off of what we used to call on radio P1s. The people who spend you're their first first choice because shoes are actually the new collectible. I think I think shoes are like the new baseball card. They're the new Beanie Babies uh, for the last few years. So Nike realized that their core demographic would probably like it, and if people who only buy a couple pairs of running shoes, you know, a year don't like them, so what? Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're much more looking for the kid that's going to stand in line for the hundred and seventy dollars Jordans. Like that's where they're that's their customer. That makes sense. Yes, my the only Nikes I own came from my millennial son, who thought the shoes I did own looked like I drove a bus. That's what he said. You look like you drive a tour bus, and therefore I am going to buy you shoes for uh, for a present. So he, <laughs> he did get me some. I wear them all the time, um, and. Uh, so, and so I think this has before we. You know, they're purchased by a millennial. I've, purchased not, by I've millennial. not purchased them. Okay. Proving the point. that Proving that I'm not their demographic. Okay. I'm an old man who wears Brooks because of their of their ergonomic balancing. <laughs> so uh, you've been in more sticky situations with companies than I've ever been in. I, I, you know, I probably ever will be in just because of what you do. You're with different companies all the time, right? By the way, PeopleDrivenResults.com. You can hire him. Um, the instinct, I think... Especially the larger the corporation grows, or the the nonprofit for that matter grows, the instinct is usually to be, I hope no one's mad at us. Let's do whatever we have to do to make sure there's no naysayers. Especially large corporations that have uh, that do mass marketing. You know, a lot of organ a lot of companies are niche markets, and they have to keep a small group of people happy, and they don't care who else likes them as long as that small group of people's happy. Whereas. Um, you know, Nike's a mass marketer. And so that's what threw people off is the idea that, hey, you're you're kind of taking the whole opposite track of NASCAR, which is big on the flag and big on support soldiers. You know, this approach is um, uh, this approach is, hey, we are going to be big on freedom of speech. And we're also going to make some social commentary on what's going on today with race and fairness. And so, uh, you know, it's a bold move for them and it's going to alienate some people and it's especially going to alienate some people generationally. And uh, I think for many companies, it's going to strike fear. As I mentioned earlier, it's going to strike fear in them because it's going to be, wow, Nike's really done well by, by, making a choice, a controversial choice, but it also uh, it works at the expense of alienating part of its market and um, 
or part of its potential market, and especially you know the part of the market that the Democrats lost in the last presidential cycle with the uh, kind of in the realignment of the country. And so it, they may not be a demographic. The hillbilly eulogy, the white blue collar, lower blue collar, um, may not be a market that Nike's after. They may be after um, highly educated city, urban kind of folks with more money, more discretionary money to spend. Okay, so there's a change management thing in here, which has been one of your things, right? Yeah. So Nike lost some... I can't imagine a company that big probably didn't lose a few people over this. I mean, you know, what do they have, 40, 60,000 employees, right? There were probably a few. They're like, I'm not doing it. I'm out. And whenever you take a bold stance, you're not just risking your customers. There is a point where you're actually risking your, um, you know, your, your people as well. On the other hand, um, Nike has always had a priority to the athlete. And so even if you might disagree politically with the stance or think it's not a good strategic move to, to pick as controversial as a conversation, um, you know, I have some family members who are quite conservative, and I still probably see one, two, uh, probably um, two memes a month about um, honor soldiers standing to the flag and the whole issue of standing for the flag. So, you know, that, that's a, it's a fairly bold strategic choice. And my guess is there were some people who disagreed with that. But Nike's priority has always been to the individual. For example, when Michael Jordan, you know, when the Olympics had, when the Olympic basketball, they had to wear Reebok. If, you, if anybody's old enough to remember that, they're all wearing Reebok. And Jordan said, I won't do it. I'm, Nike's loyal to me. I'm loyal to Nike. And Nike said, hey, it, it's fine. You can wear Reebok. They, they, they paid for the sponsorship. And Jordan did, but then he just wore his uh, warm-up over it. And uh, so it was covered up. And so they've always kind of had the back of athletes. So even if you disagree with it politically or strategically at Nike, you could, you're still probably at Nike because you're committed to the idea of let's support athletes in the challenges that they have. It's funny, when you're on campus, I remember them saying to me, amazing campus. I never understood what best places to work meant when they talked about one of the top three things things that kind of makes people loyal to a company is the physical plant or physical space. Now, admittedly, this is when Best Places Work first came out and ho- hoteling, working from home is a bigger deal now. But back in the day, that was the third biggest thing. Clear vision, clear strategy, great campus. And I remember thinking, I've never seen a campus that would make me say I want to work here. And then I saw Nike's campus and said, you would want to stay here just because of the campus. And anyway, you're walking around the campus, and the rule is if you see a professional athlete, you are not to talk to them. If you're an employee, you're not to talk to them. You spoke if spoken to. They said this is a safe place for them. We, this, this is their place. This is where they come to work. They partner with us, and they're not an athlete. They're not a star here. This is a safe place for them. And so as you can see, this would fit within the company values, even if it is a bit controversial. So my guess is they lost fewer people than another company would lose who took a similar stance because they wanted to attract a younger male market, for example. Yeah, so if you were going to leave, odds are you may not have actually ever gotten there because hopefully their hiring practices are pretty good, right? Yeah, oh, and and, and there's a, there are multiple layers of values going on here. You know, there are multiple layers of values going on for a lot of people. Um, um, you know, I think there uh, there are a number of younger people who believe that you know, he could he could do more outside of what he did on the football field to make his point, uh, and they agree with the folks that say, "Well, what's he done outside of football?" Um, and at the same time, believe that the. Uh, um, uh, you know, the phrases are the militarization of the police. Now, I'm not making a political statement on this at all. We don't have time. That's not really what we do in this podcast. But, you know, if you understand the issues, the militarization of the police, the um, uh, incarceration funnel of school dropout to incarceration funnel and the criminal justice system and even the things that Bill Clinton had to apologize for in Hillary's campaign uh, in terms of increasing incarceration rates, etc. All of those things, you know, there are a number of millennials who are like, I don't know that he picked the right way to go about it completely, but I certainly believe those are issues worth addressing. And so most of us have multiple layers on this topic. And people who are like, no, no, you support the soldiers, you stand at the flag, you deal with those issues in another space, even they can have multiple layers of feelings about the issue. So that's I think what makes it such a flashpoint issue. And so you can have an employee that's like, yeah, I support the athlete. Don't think he did it quite the right way. Um, 
and then others who say he did it exactly the right way, and I can't believe the NFL has backed down. I think the NFL, this puts the NFL in an even worse position. If I were the NFL, I'd be like, Nike, we hate you. Yeah, no, well, I, actually, I think this is, this is worth talking about because – I almost can't think of this is all in change management. One of the things you um, you know you're you're doing right. I mean you've done, yeah, and it's and, all about generational research and marketing in this case rather than getting along internally. So the NFL has made about thirty seven policy changes. Um, by the way, you are seriously the best. You're one of the most interesting people I've ever met. You're so hard to mic up. Uh, that, that's why I may have to make another adjustment there. Uh, <laughs> but you're you're millennial videographer son tells you the same thing um the nfl by contrast uh has made about 37 changes and somebody doesn't like them so first teams aren't going to come out for the uh national anthem they're not going to be out right and then it's like well you can't stand and you can't kneel then it's you can kneel then it's like well we're going to find the team if the team wants to pass the fine on to you whatever and and the whole thing just makes everybody hate them more if you only make one change it seems like people can only be so mad at you it's the follow-up that gets you well I, i i get it um and we talked about that in the past when we talked about I never had them, and it's a Friday, and I've got jet lag. Your movie ticket? Oh, movie pass. Yeah, we did do that. Yeah, when we did a podcast, I don't know, probably a month ago, on movie pass, and how many times movie pass changed their policy, changed their messaging, and how do you get bad news? I think the NFL has struggled with that. But then again, the NFL is caught in their demographics. Yeah, in terms of miking it up, hitting your mic is probably not good either, to your miking up comment. The... um, the NFL's been caught because, you know, their owners are like, no, 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 they're going to kill us. You are going to kill us um, if this goes on. And then they got killed in the millennial demographic, which is the one they're losing most. Millennial males are dropping out of football, America's sport. I mean, football has dominated American sports, and it's dropping off with millennials as badly as golf and baseball. Uh, in terms of percentage-wise, baseball's the worst in terms of, you know, real numbers and what's going to happen. The, the age of baseball's audience has gone up by, I, I think it's five years, four or five years. And so baseball is really hurting, but football surprisingly hurting. And that's what's really surprised folks, because football's done well for decades. And now, you know, they're already worried. And suddenly the demographic you're losing is mad at you. So I can understand why they, why the owners went, oh, oh, we're in trouble. Um, do we want short-term or long-term hits? But Nike is now, when it all settles down a bit, you know, it still hips on memes and things. People still talk about it. It still gets written about in the sports press. And then all of a sudden, Nike puts a spotlight on it, and then their stock goes up. If I was the NFL, I'd be like, seriously, you are killing us with our core demographic while we try to expand to the market that we're, we've taken hit upon, hit upon. So I can understand why the NFL is all over the place. It'll be interesting to see how they respond to this. Okay, so before we move on, because I want to touch on a couple other brands that are winning, you know, kind of via not political controversy, but other kinds of controversy. Before we move on, do you like so, you know, you talk a lot about change management and the pain and like managing that for, you know, nine months to two years a lot of times. Right. Internally, externally, whatever. Yeah. Um, When have you have you advised a company to change back like you talk about people throwing doing change back things like i'm going to throw a fit i'm going to make your life as hard as possible until you get our department back to the way i like it right uh but like have you done that well occasionally companies have to change back the you know they try something and the market very clearly says we don't like it we're not going to buy it or it's too early you know uh for example the classic example of changing back is coca-cola now Xers will remember this. Millennials, this is one of those um, stories that your uncle tells before your time. Um, the uh, you know when they went to the Rolling Stones concert or uh, or you know Green Day, um, one of those stories before your time. But you know Coke, Pepsi was winning um, in the market clearly because everybody wanted a sweeter product, and so Coca Cola releases new Coke which tasted like Pepsi, and then. People complained like crazy, and then it crashed. And so they brought back Coke Classic. And that's what we drink today. Everybody knows Coke. Coke is a much more popular product with millennials. Coke just kicked Pepsi's butt over the last 20 years when Pepsi was claiming to be the taste of a new generation and really was grabbing significant percentage of younger demographic market share. And so one of the great debates is whether or not 
Coke actually did it on purpose to try to shock people into paying attention to Coke Classic again by taking it away. And that was a cla- that was a change that was probably the most success one of the most famous successful change back. But companies do it all the time. Make a decision, walk it back. Politicians do it all the time. Make a decision, float some balloons, walk it back, and. Um, I don't know, and, and I think the camp, the parties, the NFL is caught into what the political parties are stuck in right now, which is what do you do in the great alignment where we've moved from southern states being Democratic and northern states being Republican uh, for centuries, for centuries, for a century, and now it's shifting from um, a, a, a political, religious, and class to an education level determining, uh, having much greater prediction on whether you're Republican or Democratic. And um, it's a huge realignment that nobody was ready for in the last election, and Nike's caught in the middle of, between its older and younger demographics. Okay. Uh, let Let me just point out one thing about Coke maybe doing that on purpose. That is a thing that's discussed in the PR world, believe it or not, is... There are PR people, and I I don't subscribe to this because I'm just not into lying. There are PR people out there that say, we're going to screw something up, and then you're going to apologize for it because it'll make you look vulnerable, and it'll play really well. I mean, particularly with, you talk about vulnerability and, like, apologies and stuff, that particularly plays well with, you you know, millennials and down. I, I think most organizations screw up enough stuff anyway. You know, Apple, for example, has had a number of things that people have not been happy with. Um, They've made choices about how you, you know, what kind of connector you have on your phone was the last one. I had the iPhone 4 with uh, Antenna Gate, and, you know, I had an iPhone 6 Plus with Bin Gate. So Apple's had enough problems of their own without making something up. But you're right. That's exactly right. PR people are like, we need some buzz. We need some vulnerability. Uh, What can we goof up? And Mike, you know, it's kind of like marriage. I mess up enough on my own without having to try to fake a mess up. I, I already have. A, I already do it well enough. Okay, let, let's go out on a couple of because uh, because we're twenty four minutes. We're doing two episodes, so uh, stick around. We'll do another broadcast in just a minute. Uh, if you uh, want to do that, and if you have any questions about. Uh, this whole thing, you know, Hayden in particular is brilliant at this whole change management, dealing with uh, sensitive stuff, working it through your organization type of stuff. And I, I'm good at other things, which I will tell you about at the end because I haven't plugged myself yet. Uh, OK, can we break down the Apple thing for a minute? Uh, because uh, like I really cannot believe how much like I almost feel like I have an ulcer over the new iPhones. And yet what's funny, so Amanda and I are switching to the Note 9s tomorrow, uh, and I, I have a lot of technical reasons why I'm doing that, uh, including, you know, I think your smartwatch is dying. The new um, uh, the new Samsung watches last like a week if you don't keep the always-on display on, uh, which is crazy because you could just take off, fly without your charger, right? It's really nice. However, and I'm not saying I hate Apple because I think our next desktop will be uh, an Apple uh, that Amanda, you know, does work on or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so I, I just like the spell has been broken for me. I, I think that since they got a new CEO, uh, Tim Cook kind of lost the way of the company. Uh, and they used to make the best stuff in the world. And when you make the best stuff in the world, hands down, you can charge whatever you want. And when your primary competitor, Microsoft, has Steve Ballmer, who uh, I mean, I think his style of leadership was like hitting himself in the head with a baseball bat five times and then making a decision. Uh, I mean, when, when your competition's that bad, it's really easy to win. And what's happened now is they make the second or third best thing in the category and they charge more money. But what's weird about that is I would say that uh, among young, and this is totally anecdotal, but among younger consumers, there's almost, uh, in particular, there's almost a uh, stigma about not having the blue bubble. Oh, I, you know, I, I was talking on Tuesday in Vegas to a group of executives, and when I, when I one of the things I mentioned about what do um, emerging adults want, people 18 to 28, one of the things that comes up clearly in research, Cisco did a study on it, was uh, being able to choose your own hardware. And in the number of people in these, there were some huge companies and then a lot of smaller, medium-sized companies. They were distributors for a um, 
And they all made a face. And I said, I know your IT people will hate having to support because they just had a wonderful speaker who was talking about Internet security. I said, your IT people are already going to be overwhelmed by all the things you just learned this morning to do. And now I'm telling you to do it on Mac and PC. I said, but how many of you, how, how many of your kids um, want a Mac to go to college? I said, matter of fact, most of the people with PCs are either engineering students or the software or math where the software, there's not enough software for a, a Mac. Or there are people whose parents gave them a PC from work. They have a family business, and their parents went, here, take this PC, and that's uh, it. Uh, or, I mean, the other category is video games. So That's right. Gamers. Yes. Uh, gamers who have built their own systems or have a have a Predator laptop like Seth here. <laughs> Which is running our uh, our Facebook Live. No, I, I just thought that was interesting, like the lock-in thing, and particularly generational. I mean, even crossing over to pop culture, the rapper Lecrae has a line that said... Uh, tell my haters that they're like the green messages on my iPhone. I probably never got the message. The green bubbles on my iPhone, uh, which I thought was a, a pretty brilliant line. But Apple, and I, actually I think this is uh, this is going to sound like kind of a millennial diss, but uh, I think it's something that's uh, pretty important. So millennials are extremely into the narrative, which is why any kind of like public good company is going to, you know, is going to have an advantage, even if it's not true. So Shinola watches was supposed to be there about seven hundred bucks. Uh, I, I would say I want one at some point, even though it's probably a lie. They uh, started as like this company to bring good jobs to Detroit, and you know, kind of make these pretty cool kind of mid-level watches, right? Yeah. And they may not be doing it. Like, I, to me, it's a little murky as to whether or not how much actually they're doing for Detroit and how much they're, you know, kind of keeping their manufacturing costs down, right? But just the fact that the story's there, even though it's not true, wins. For Apple, uh, I, I would say that, uh, you know, there's less of an emphasis on quality because if you break it down, they actually made the battery smaller this time around on the uh, XS uh, phone. And, I mean, if you do run the specs against it, as far as performance, you know, you've got the Note 8. I'm getting the Note 9 tomorrow and saying very well to this guy. Uh, the specs, I mean, as a an objective buyer, there's almost no way you can, you know, really want to go spend $1,500 on the same phone that I'm getting with discounts for about $600 with switching to Verizon. Okay. But the narrative is that dang strong. Uh, I'm just in pain that you got it for $600. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to need at least 20 minutes to recover from that <laughs> bit of information. Yeah, $300 trade-ins, and then I talked him into a bonus, uh, a couple hundred bucks more off. So, yeah. yeah obviously, I suck at uh, negotiating, so I'm, I'm going to need a moment to regather <laughs> myself and cry live okay I'm ready okay I mean it is live so I didn't know how long you were going to take <laughs> uh, but would you would you so the, the good news and the bad news is the good news is you can win like that the bad news is eventually I think people are going to see the holes in your story uh, but but it hasn't yet for Apple well I think for a couple of reasons the first one is there's just a huge cachet to it um, they've got a great brand young now um, you know, because part of the episode here is millennials and brands. What brands are millennials into? And Apple has one most intimate brand. They were fourth last year, and uh, they are number one. Uh, they've made huge progress this year on being the most intimate brand. Um, and so, uh, and then there was another survey of jobs, places millennials would want to work. They're all tech. Apple's one of the top um, jobs, places millennials would want to work. So, you know, everybody, all the big brands in tech. Um, or where they want to go. And so, you know, uh, and, and of course, gamers, uh, one of the top 10 uh, most intimate brands. You've got, uh, other than YouTube, which made the top four, um, you, you know, you've got Nintendo, you've got PlayStation, and it, it, you've, um, you've got the things that, they're, that they use most often, the things that um, give the most value to their life. Amazon and Prime gives a lot of value to their life. And so, as a result, Apple is a place they want to work. Apple is a brand that they care about. Apple is a brand that, that they're intimate with. And as a result, it's got a huge staying power. That story has a lot of cachet to it. They may The laptop may not be as good. But when it comes to the watch and to the phone, I, I agree with you that from a business tool, there's a lot of reasons why the phone's not the thing you want. 
Um, but when it comes from having a great camera and being able to do what a what a 17 or a 23 year old needs it to do, um, it's a more of a media device than it is a work tool. One of the reasons you're switching is you need a you, you need a work tool that allows you to move stuff faster through social media, and you're looking at what you get for the price. I don't. My, my daughter never thought twice about getting when, in order when it was her turn getting an iPhone. X, you get an iPhone 10. She never thought twice about it. It's never a consideration, although her brother, um, who's more techie, was like, oh, seriously, you need to get away from Apple and get to Android. Just not a serious consideration on her part. It's not what she thinks about. It's easy. She knows how to use it, and it's part of an ecosystem. So I think there's a lot of reasons why there's some staying power until you get a job, to your point, to your example, till you get a job where it's PC at work, it's... And, you know, I want to do some things on my phone that Apple won't allow. And um, and then that narrative changes. And it's not about the story as much as about what it does. Yeah. Well, let's let's wrap up on this, because I, I do think that the, the kind of the, the theme of this episode is you got to decide who the heck you are. Right. No matter. I mean, I don't care if you're an engineering firm or a lawn care service or you're a, a nanny. OK, you got to decide who the heck you are. And then you got to decide who you're okay with ticking off in order to really double down on those people who are really going to care about you, right? And so it's getting to the point, I'm not even, like, angry at Apple because, like, I look at my mom and, uh, you know what, she has an iPhone, she has an iPad, they pretty much work for good, right? Right. Um, so that's something that works for her. I look at myself as someone who's much more techy, much more concerned with uh, performance and, and that type of thing. And so Apple used to be a machine for the creative class. And it's funny, just breaking the hold, Amanda was like, you know, but all the way through college, because she went to, she got a full ride to fashion school. My yeah. wife, uh, you know, she was like, we were preached at Apple, Apple, Apple the whole time. And she's like, well, the watch just doesn't look like, you know, it doesn't look like an Apple watch, the Galaxy watches. But this actually, I mean, it looks like a watch, you know. Uh, it, this isn't one of my. I don't have one yet. Just a regular watch because I sold my Apple Watch because I'm going away from it. But it looks uh, like it. But it looks. I mean, the Galaxy Watch looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had to ask her to detach herself from the narrative. Uh, okay, so do you actually like that square chiclet-looking Apple Watch, or is it because it's become so iconic? So if I showed it to you with no narrative, she's like, "Oh, I would think it's ugly." You know, and I showed you this watch. It's like, oh, I would like that, right? Uh, that's how powerful the narrative is. And when you can do a really good job with it, uh, you know, you can uh, basically talk people into a lot of stuff. Uh, and I've, I, I've said on, I, I, I've, we've talked about it because you've yeah. been asking people on Facebook. I miss the watch. Um, that is by far my favorite watch. And I... Um, and it is an amazing product, and their new watch looks even more amazing. So uh, I miss that. It was almost enough to keep me on the iPhone was to the, the the watch. And if Apple had had a replacement for my Bingate phone in time, they just decided not to stock phones even though they were under warranty. And so I needed a phone to fly out, and I couldn't wait a week to yeah. get it. If they would have had it, I would have stayed with it to keep the watch. Okay. Uh, so here's where we uh, I think can wrap on that right so Apple decided Apple used to be a machine for the creative class and they're okay with being a simple operating system for everybody and that means they lose people like me who loved them for something very differently right and it means they put their priorities as far as what they're going to develop to some little like blah 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 emoji thing that I think is stupid uh, that you can like make an emoji out of yourself uh, and they haven't updated their core stuff like pages or numbers or like products I use all the time. The bottom line is people who are buying their laptops, for the most part, don't care. They want to make a document once in a while. They want to be on the Internet. They want to check email. And they like it because they can get their text messages on their laptop. Uh, and so they got to be OK with letting people like me go. Right. Well, I think that makes complete sense. It doesn't mean they won't put focus on that. But I think one of the things that I know you were criti you're critical of their CEO. And I think he's made a decision that we're a media company and these are media devices more than their work devices. Now, they're pushing their enterprise really hard as a competitive enterprise offering. But um they're not supporting some of their workhorse items, as you picked up, either their laptops and they bought their, they bought their laptop game in the last year. But they're not putting the same level of energy on the business side of things as they are on 
the older demographic and the younger demographic. Turn yourself into emoji for the younger demographic. Make it really easy for this whole ecosystem to work. And my wife still can't download photos from her phone to her PC, but Apple makes that possible and easier. Uh, in her case, it is an Apple, but uh, she's, a, she's a wonderful person. The uh, um, And our son comes to dinner, and so she makes him help um, as payback. But it makes it easier for your mom to get stuff done. It's a pretty simple system. Most people get it for their parents rather than get a Samsung tablet because it's just easier to make work. And the fact is the phone is easier than an Android. Android gives you a lot more possibilities, but a lot more possibilities has complexity to it. And so Apple's made their choices, build an eco ecosystem that's simple and grown the periphery of that. And, um, you know, Love them or hate them, uh, they are still a hot brand for the millennials because they've made some choices and uh, have have in order to, and grown the cachet. They they pick the things that younger people want. Uh, oh, we got a question before we we bounce off. But that's okay. I'll get it here. Uh, can I read that from there? Uh, oh, here. Uh, I'm 55. I can't read that from here. Okay, I'm, I'm getting to your post. Let's do that question, then wrap up. Uh, by the way, while I look that up, um, once again, he's Hayden Shaw. You got people in process issues, peopledrivenresults.com. My name is Seth Tower Heard, uh, and I uh, run a company called Digital Profit Farm. We do websites, SEO, search engine optimization, make you show up so you can get customers. And uh, we also do social media management and obviously podcasting, reach about 75,000 uh, people a month. Uh, and so, um, oh, no, it actually isn't, and an, it's not a. It's not a question. It's just a, a guy named Scooter who basically says Hayden's the greatest thing ever. Uh, Scooter, and, thank you. Uh, he he likes the Garmin Vivo Active HR. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. A lot of people. I mean, it's, it, it it has almost like a um, cult following. The Garmin Vivo Eight does. Yeah. yeah. So get so, it. Have you missed part of the? Uh, you know the. Live broadcast. Uh, well, obviously, it'll be up for replay in a minute. Uh, and, uh, you know, if this is a podcast, then you don't care that you missed uh, part of the live broadcast. So, once again, Hayden Shaw, PeopleDrivenResults.com. Uh, my name is Seth Tower Heard. And uh, pick something, stick to it, uh, and uh, don't change your mind 37,000 times. Stick with your core demographic. Is that pretty much, that's a good last word? It is a great last word. All It, you know, it, it is not going to be easier. Now that Organize, like Nike have demonstrated that organizations can make money being political and taking stands on political topics. I mean, that's been demonstrated in other controversial topics over the last five to seven years, especially. Um, it is going to mean that businesses are thrust into what they've tried to stay out of. And so you're going to have to make some choices. And you can try to get to everybody, but somebody's going to be offended sooner or later because, as you can see, television, movie stars, they offend people when they don't even try to. Um, let alone those that go out of their way to be offensive. And so it is a new world and you're going to have to pick, you're going to have to pick your message. You're going to, have to pick your narrative and you're going to have to pick your market, whether you, uh, and it's a great thing for niches and it's a reality for bigger brands. Um, it's a new generational world and people said it was going to get a little rocky, a little rougher. And we're now here with the millennials as, as a major buying block and not just a coming buying block. And we're seeing it. Uh, we're seeing what was predicted 10 years ago come true now. Hey, we're going to do another episode. If you happen to be joining us on Facebook Live, I mean, come on, let's face it. It's Friday afternoon. If you're um, if you're self-employed, you're obviously burned out if you're just sitting here watching Facebook videos or, you know, you got it on while you're doing something else, in which case you can still do it. And, uh, you know, if you work for a larger company, nobody else is working that hard either. It's 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. So we will be back in a minute. 